Okay, I'd like to call to order the Human Services Committee meeting. Um, first item on the agenda is the courtesy of the floor. Next item on the agenda is the update on Graysdale. Mr. Soto, please. company who owned it was a southern company. Yeah, yeah, well. They were out of where? Tennessee. Oh, Tennessee right? yeah. Huge, huge company. so much more community oriented and <laughs> okay well the first item on the agenda is uh, census census has taken a hit in December and January Pretty much we've had 49 deaths between December and January, so we're trying to recover. We've had some concerns, but we have a lot of different ideas that we've been implementing to try to increase census, and one of which uh, I'm working personally with admissions to go ahead and ensure that the flow getting into the facility is, is smooth with regards to sign-ins and tours and things like that so we don't lose any potential residents. We also are working with a lot of the hospice companies to provide us with respite. So this way, um, they come in for a couple of days just for a break. That allows us the time to build the census up. In addition, of course, to the hospitals to try to go ahead and drum up business as well uh, for our facility. And a good news is we look like we have an inspection next Tuesday for the VA contract with Wilkes Bar. And it looks like uh, if everything goes well with the inspection, we will have that contract and we'll be able to take in a lot of uh, VA residents who need um, skilled nursing. So those are the things that we're working on with regards to census. I could tell you yesterday we had five admissions and today, between today and Monday, we will have 12. So we are moving and grooving and things are finally starting to pick up. We're getting a lot more walk-ins too. I'll tell you a quick story about a gentleman, very nice guy who came to us because his sister, um, excuse me, his niece had kicked him out of the house. His sister was in ICU. He had no place to live. He was in the Red Roof Inn. And he came to us, he was living in his car. He was in his 80s. We immediately got um, aging involved and we were able to admit him into our facility. So um, that's definitely a success story, one of many. You know, and it was, it was a very nice uh, thing. We all got together and we did everything we can to get him in that day. Mr. Davis. I, I, I think the last thing we, we talked about how the, the private sector, you know, catches up to the, you know, the aging population and, and so that that affects our, our uh, occupancy rate there. Um, do we see that being continue to be a long term problem? And I mean, I know, we, I know we just sold some beds, but I mean, is Grace Steel too big or, or, you know? 
Well, I mean, um, Graystale, uh, it, it manages to hold its own. We're going through a, a little bit of a problem right now, but it's not going to stay continuous because, you know, residents need a place to stay. And although we don't get as many of the short-term rehab and some acute that we'd like to get, we do get a lot of the people who do need the assistance long-term, you know, who um, may or may not uh, have Medicare, but they definitely have Medicaid. So we are able to assist them as well, as well but we're still keeping the short-term rehab aspect up because that's our bread and butter. And um, we are looking at our case mix index, you know, which is a kind of a rate that we have for our nursing home to show us the rate of reimbursement, how much we're getting. And right now we're at 0 .80, we were at 0 0.75 before, and by May we should be at 1.0. Now, that's taken over because, you know, in the old days, well, hold it, like last year, um, nursing homes had that pay for performance where they only let that go up so much, that's gone. We're not doing that anymore. We're like the private sector, so we have to keep increasing our case mix index so that we can see benefits from reimbursement. So that's another thing we're working on, you know, to try to get our revenue up. Any other questions with regards to admissions? Oh, just Mr. so you Phelps? know. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yo, um, Ms. Soto, the, um, the VA, re remind us what the pipeline is. In other words, you're getting a, um, an interview next week. If that's positive, then when do you think, how long it would be before we'd actually see residents? Well, we've already agreed to the contract and the rates, which are pretty good. Um, this is a formality, and of course, you know, if it was really bad, that would affect it, but for the most part, it's just something that they have to do as part of the last part of the, you know, of the contract, the process. Yes, thank you. And it, so then, so do you, do you think in April we will see uh, VA uh, patients affecting the, uh, the, the, uh, um, the bed um, numbers? Oh, yeah, absolutely, because we're at the, that stage where we're pretty much at the end and, and ready to accept residents. They just have to give it to eyeball us and make sure that we have everything in place. Mr. Warner? Um, yeah. Matt, do you remember the gentleman that spoke? Someone here, anyone remember the gentleman that spoke that was asking about building a facility? In um, M Mark Bayless. Mark. <clears throat> Will this be of a benefit to tell him about this? Well, except for uh, so the 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 guys that he deal with are, are generally physically fine. They're just going through emotional rehab and, and that of the PTSD more or less. So I think it's a little bit different, uh, but uh, it definitely you know may, maybe could definitely still they probably definitely encounter a lot of people that could go into. His concern was they couldn't get they had a lot of problems right. getting to that area, and I don't. Yeah, but I, I, so the the ones that be going. <laughs> Here instead of Wilkesbury, I, I mean, they're, I'm just they're not able to uh, travel or whatever. You know, is, is my guess? Is that right? Yeah. Yes. I don't believe that Wilkesbury has uh, the VA hospital. And correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know, but I don't know that they have like long-term care there. For, that, you know, Graystale's long-term care. Wilkesbury VA is an acute just, care just hospital. Out, out, outpatient. Were, there was a question of whether they could keep. The, that's where they um, as Mr. Dietz is saying, um, I've encountered Mr. Bellis numerous times, being from the Slate Belt, mm -hmm. um, and he is looking <clears throat> to build a hospital, not a long-term care facility, as Mr. Vaughn is saying. So we will be able to take some of the people. He's, he's trying to build a not, psychiatric hospital. He's trying correct. to build a hospital overall, and then a have, medical facility. Correct hospital. is what they were looking to do oh, wow. in that okay. instance. So it's you know like <laughs> night and day, obviously. That's um, a huge undertaking. As Mr. Dietz was saying, he's you know looking to build that facility. We will be able to help other veterans who are in, you know, a long-term care need. So they don't have a lot of yeah. VA. They don't have any VA long-term care facilities strictly for veterans. So us getting the contract will allow us to take the veterans if this is their situation. That's actually very good news. Thank you. For the short term. For the short term, yes. You've got empty rooms. You have a couple. Yeah. There's some just open up another way. This <laughs> rate. Any other questions? Oh, um, I wanted to also point out, excuse me, <laughs> that um, our Medicare days did increase from December from 24.6 to 32.7 in January. 
due to the increase in the number of Medicare admissions, which is important because even though our census has come down, our Medicare census has gone up, and that's where our highest rate of reimbursement is. Uh, any other questions on admissions before I move to finance? Yeah, I uh, yeah. just want to make a comment. I was uh, at a restaurant, and I saw the Graystill ad on the placement. On the placement? <laughs> <laughs> that's good. And I thought, that's a great idea. All these old people are sitting here eating and looking at Graystill, you know? So it was a, it's a good idea. I mean, they work. Jack Delisandro's idea. That was Jack's idea? That was Jack Delisandro's But I mean, I look down, and it's like, this is great. You know, it's the first thing. I, you're right. You have a good placement because you're right there where, you know, you have to look down and see it. But right in the middle. <laughs> you should be getting... Uh, Thank oh, you. Did yeah. that just start, or did that oh, just? Oh, well, that's been gone. Uh, that's been on. Yeah. I must year. not go to the restaurants yeah. where the, all the old people are targeted. Well, you have to go where us old people go. And I'll try to. I'll try to come to Easton more often. Yes. <laughs> but I like it. It's a great. Your question, it's a great idea. And I noticed it a year ago, so I go yeah. to the places that where the old know, people go. go. It's a great idea, though. It works. It's nice. It's nice. I like it. So. Yeah. Thank you. At Lewis. Uh, is there an extra one? Oh, oh sure. Okay, any other questions before I move on? No? Okay. Uh, finance uh, and Medicare reimbursement. Cost per resident per day dropped from $260.60 at the end of December to $192.52 in January due to a decrease in census. So it shows that we're being proactive in terms of the cost. When the census goes down, the cost of the resident goes down as well. Um, other finances, we're waiting for the numbers. They usually come next month for the previous month because they don't close until uh, towards the end of the month for the previous month. Sorry about that. And I already talked to you about the CMI and what we're doing with that. So that's finance and Medicare reimbursement. Does anybody have any other questions? Yes. Just uh, one, not Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, the governor's budget uh, came out last week and there is no budgeted increase for nursing homes for Medicaid. Um, is is that something that we had anticipated or, or not? My understanding is that we didn't. No. We, did not. we no. did not anticipate an increase. We did not anticipate an increase, and that's where um, Mr. Warner and you know, the rest of us worked with the um, IGP. Mm. That's kind of their thing at this moment for the county homes, but you know, we, did not, we did not put that in our budget. We don't think it was wrong. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions before I move on? Okay. Uh, with regard to nursing, um, CNA agency was utilized during the holidays for a cost of $7,877. And, you know, that was New Christmas, New Year's, around that time. We do not use them unless absolutely necessary, so this is not a trend. Uh, with regards to our RN, LPN, and CNA overtime, all overtime is down from December due to a decrease in census for since December to January. CNA overtime was practically cut in half from $4,134 in December to $2,451.25 in January due to a further decrease in our one-to-one -one observation from eight to four residents. And actually, we're probably going to be dropping the three residents because one of the residents, the one who has the Huntington's career, is finally going to New Jersey to a Huntington's career unit that I found uh, through the Huntington's Association. So she'll be properly placed. Uh, she's leaving next week. And she's someone who's been difficult, you know, throwing TVs and radios and, and you know, things along those lines when she doesn't get her cigarette in, t in time. So that has been a major deal for us because no one else would take her. So <laughs> it's, it's a tough, it's a very tough disease, unfortunately. Anything, any other questions with nursing before I go to compliance and risk? Yes. The per diem pool. How is that working out since we've instituted it? We, we do have a couple of people in the per diem pool. <clears throat> um, we need to get more, and we are doing a mailing. You are know, they picking try. shifts up? Um, in some respects, yes, but we still need you know, more help. And we are sending out a mass mailing uh, to all our ends, because our ends are what we primarily are looking for to get to increase that per diem pool as well as the positions that we have available too. We do have some, um, you know, some people who are interested in it, so that is helpful. And 
the greater we can make our per diem pool, you know, of course, then we can utilize them. But of course, it's hard because you know, these people are not just sitting around waiting for us to call. <laughs> you know, they have other jobs and it has to coordinate. So, but we are doing it. Okay. Uh, any other questions before I go to compliance and risk? No? Okay. As you know, we did have our annual survey. Uh, it occurred from the 10th to the 13th of January 2017. Uh, we did receive nine deficiencies. Our nine deficiencies were all low-level deficiencies, meaning nothing higher than a D, which means that a potential for harm was there, but no actual harm was caused. So there were no Gs at all. And just to let you know, we did not receive any deficiencies with regards to the area of pressure sores, um, any areas of weight loss, you know, any of the major quality of care issues that um, usually a facility would receive. We're also under the average. The average is 14 deficiencies for the state of Pennsylvania. Any questions before I move on to the life yeah, safety? Uh, yes. So um, this is a part I, I ask all the time, and I, I, I probably don't understand it, but when we had the um, problem with the, the woman uh, attempting suicide and that was a deficiency. That that gave us a G rating, and, and doesn't that G rating still carry with is, carry it? Yes, but, it does. But you wouldn't know that from here, right? Because this is the annual survey. That was a complaint. That, oh, actually, a reportable event survey. But we're still under a G rating, right? Yes, we do have that G that will stay with us. I guess what I'm I guess what I'm thinking about is when I look at this, unless I follow that because I ask questions on this every month. But if I I wouldn't know from this that we're under a G rating, and and should we? I, mean, I guess maybe we'll ask that to, to other people. Sure. Yeah. What happens with this, Mr. Phillips, is that these each are rated. It's not that the facility is under any kind of rating itself. It's each individual one that happens. So when um, Mr. Soto talks about a D rating or this or that. It's not that we're labeled with that particular rating for any period of time. This goes on our record and it stays there. So it's not that, again, the facility is rated under G. This one event was a G rated event. So does that help you understand? Our, Mr. Phillips, our ratings are, are determined by stars. Correct. It's not got anything to do so with it. If you get more deficiencies, your star rating goes, goes down. down. That's how it's labeled on Medicare Medicaid sites. But so I think when this was explained to us, I was <clears throat> my interpretation was, was explained to me was that this G rating would be with us, but at some point it would go away. It takes several years for it to go away. But again, it's on our record. If you go to the CMS website and look at the ratings, the star ratings, it gives you the deficiencies that were on there and what they're rated. It doesn't say that Graysdale is a G-rated facility. It simply says we have three stars on quality care um, or three stars in the mix because we have a G rating, we have a D rating, we have this. It gives you each, each incident that happened and what that incident is rated. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. Okay. So, but, but we do know all the um, the different deficiencies that we're sort of carrying on our back Absolutely. right now mm -hmm. that um, that is is part of the composition of that star rating. That is correct. We have we know them, and the public knows them if they go to the website to see about the star rating. So it's not just us that know what happened or what the deal is. It is on a public CMS website so that everybody knows what they are. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, if uh, anybody, any other questions? Okay, I'll move on to just life safety. We also had the life safety survey after the clinical survey. That occurred from the 23rd to the 24th. Um, we received uh, 17K tags, nine of which are K tags that are generally repeated on existing issues. So if you take those nine away, you have eight. Um, K tags have no bearing on the star rating. And um, just so you know, for the clinical and for the life safety, plan of correction submitted and accepted by the state. And uh, we're in the process of a revisit to see, you know, just to see that we're getting the work done, which we are. Any other questions on compliance and risk? Yes. 
Where where is the star rating on this? Oh, it's a, actually it's in the, the very end. It's page two on the bottom. CMS star yeah. rating. Mm -hmm. Got you. Thank you. Okay, sure. It's the All right. Um, if you don't mind, you don't I'll move on to quality measures. Uh, quality measures. Uh, facility acquired pressure ulcers dropped from 74 in December to 52 in January. Um, the reason for that is also, you know, when you have less census, you have less people who come in with um, less pressure sores. But as the census increases, it usually goes up, and then we're, we're taking care of them. Facility acquired, acquired infections did increase from 89 to 114, and the infection control rate did jump from 4.5 in December to 5.78 in January, and that was due to norovirus issues that we had on several of the units that were not, I wouldn't say quarantine, but def definitely under observation, which were Tower 5, Tower 9, and Tower 10. Since that time, they've all lifted. So they're fine. And then we still have Northwest 1 and Southeast 2, uh, but they're pretty much going to be lifted by the beginning of next week. Uh, Mr. And, Soto, yes. uh, how is the, the status of influenza through the hospital? Actually, um, you mean the nursing home? Actually, well, <laughs> we're very good. I mean, our influenza rate is, is um, excellent because we're like at 99.5% for residents all receiving the influenza vaccine. And we're about 96% on the uh, pneumococcal vaccine as well. So for residents, we're great. Staff, it's another thing. We're in the 60, 69%. We're trying to get it up, but you know that there, there are facilities, meaning hospitals or nursing homes, that do take a more proactive approach and say you're required to have it, and then there are other ones that stay away from it because it could be a liability issue, they're concerned about OSHA, that kind of thing. But we do a very positive thing for the staff. If they do get the flu vaccine, they will get a free lunch and a free dress down day. And I was one of the first ones to get that vaccine. Just, you know, lead by example. But we still need to get more people. <laughs> So Who says there's no such thing as a free lunch? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the only thing is that entree could only be between certain days, and if you didn't get it, you lost it. <laughs> but it was, it was pretty good. Any other questions with regards to quality measures? I just have one. Yes. Um, the benchmark for facility-acquired infections, that's what I was just asking Mr. Vaughn about. It just seems, is that set too low? It just seems that zero is, is almost unobtainable. That's true. However, the CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, does believe that you should have no facility-acquired infections, meaning that you come into the facility, if you get them from the hospital, you, you know, take care of them and treat them, but in-house you should have none. We're held to a very high standard. Actually, all the nursing homes are, and that's all over the country. Okay. Yeah. So zero, unfortunately, is what it is, and that's what they expect. Okay. Uh, any other questions with regards to quality? I mean, it, it looks like you're attaining almost all your benchmarks. Um, the only one that stands out is the antipsychotic medication yes. use. Um, is that talked about or is it even discussed or are we just kind of? It's not only talked about or discussed, it's actual committee I see. of all the interdisciplinary teams, including psychiatrists, to do our best to reduce. This is a huge deal for us because we can get this number um, under wraps, then we can improve our star rating with quality measures and that'll improve our overall star rating. We go up to two stars on quality measures, we'll bump up a star already on overall. Yeah, I, I mean, because you're being brought down by the quality measures on the star ratings. So um, you might even help with falls, too. Yeah, we do have a falls committee as well um, as that, a pain committee and a wound committee. So with the implementation, implementation of those and the recommendations from the committees for the units on a case-by-case -case basis, we're starting to improve that situation. Great. Thank you. Any other questions before I move on? Okay, thank you. Hey, Seth, I have, a, I have a question. So, so for the long-term pain, the, the benchmark is an 8.6% rating. No, excuse me, a 19. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm getting myself on a, a confused here. Long term, it's 8.6, and that's the benchmark, and we have 13.6.
What what is what does that mean again? What's like eight point six and nineteen point six? What does that mean? Well, the percentage of people who should have pain in a, uh, who are long term yeah. in the facility. We have a greater number because people are debilitating; they're getting sicker. We are treating the pain, but it depends on the diagnosis and what's going on. If we're able to effectively treat the pain, or if it's related to something else. So you you're just seeing people getting older and and sicker. Unfortunately, you know the. Yeah. Uh, pathology of the individual is just, you know, as they get older, it's, it's difficult, you yeah. know, it's hard for them. Yeah, and I don't, I don't even know, if I, yeah, I think I understand that. I, yeah. I think that there's probably problems with uh, hospitals, at least, that's probably knows this, of, because of this kind of benchmark, oversubscribing uh, pain, pain right. killers, no really. So and you have I always look at that as like, you know, yeah. I'm not saying, say, it's actually, I, I get the number. Thanks. Yeah. And pain is very tricky because, I mean, you have the pain scales that you could use, the Braden scales, where you're going by their facial expressions, but yeah. unless they tell you or they, they show an expression, how do you know when they're really in pain? Yeah. You know? Okay. Um, satisfaction, we're at 3.99, which still puts us above a 3. We kind of fluctuate between 3.99 and 4.1, um, and that's for overall in the entire building. Uh, FMLA, uh, sick call-outs, we are at 198, but they have decreased because we were higher in December. And then you saw the overall star rating, we're at uh, overall a three, four on the regulatory compliance, uh, three on staffing, and one on quality measures that we're working on. Well, all of them, actually. Any other questions? No? All right, the last thing I wanted to show you was just the handout I gave you. Just letting you know that we are, um, here we are, out of 53 nursing facilities in Pennsylvania who received the basic QAPI accreditation, uh, we are one of those 53 facilities you could see on page two. I would have, I mean, sorry, page three. I would have loved to have given you an actual, like, award certificate or something, but this is how they list it, unfortunately. But we are one of those facilities that are QAPI accredited, QAPI meaning quality assurance performance improvement. So we are well on our way to working um, to have continuous quality improvement in our facilities. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I know I elaborate. I, I touched on a little bit about the quality measures. Um, what, from your opinion, what do you think is the main driver bringing our star ratings down for quality measures? Um, Antipsychotics. Is that, is that it? It's, yeah. We have a lot of residents who have psych issues in our facility. You know, the long-termers who have had psych issues or, or may not have been treated their entire lives and they came into the facility and they were finally treated with psychotropic medications and they need these medications. We continuously through that committee try to reduce the um, amount of medication to try to wean them off. And some you can, and then some you can't, as long as there's justification to show that you're trying. The state's okay with it, but it's the inordinate amount of people that we have are there, on psychotropics. Are there, are there any um, psychiatrists on that committee? There, yes. We actually have Dr. Rafai from Easton Hospital, and he's been really good. I mean, uh, when I first met him, it's, it's like nobody had realized to just contact him and talk to him, and now yeah. he provides in-service training. He does our competencies. He's always available, and he really gives good you know, information to the staff as well as the residents, and he's very proactive. Also, Dr. Hussein as well and Dr. Sierra are all proactive in trying to reduce the psychotropic medications. You think, you think any of them might be interested in coming and speaking with us about the situation? I could ask Dr. Rafai, sure. Yeah, if, just, if, if, mm. if the board would be interested in, in hearing about it. I would. Oh, okay. 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 If, I, if I could just follow up on what you just asked. Um, a couple of years ago, they closed uh, the state uh, mental health, Allentown State Hospital, a bunch of other um, large facilities. Is what you just mentioned a um, unintended consequence of the closure of the state hospital facilities, both in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Yes, you do inherit, you know, the individual, and with them is their psychiatric issues and problems, and 
you know, if they've been long-term psyched for many years, like since they're teenagers or something like that, to say, okay, I'm going to wean them off. <laughs> it's, it's almost impossible, you know, with, with regards to some residents. Some you can, but some, uh, they're just, um, it's, they're used to what they have. And, you know, if you, even if they know that they're getting it reduced, they almost kind of sabotage themselves to continue on it because that's all they've ever known. Well, it, it just seems to me like we closed one institution, and what we've seen is, on the one hand, uh, some of these uh, folks have wound up in the jail, and now you're telling me some of them have wound up in the nursing home. So closing the state hospital facilities merely moved just moves folks who were being treated there to other places, and, um, you know, it's... It's just a consequence of what happened. So I'm, I'm disappointed to hear that, that now we, we've seen it both in our jail and in our nursing home. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, they have no other place to go. They have to go somewhere. So, and here we are. Okay. And, and there's issues with that. People don't want that in their neighborhoods, and you know, it's hard for them. Yeah. But they have to go somewhere, unfortunately, so we take care of them. Does anybody else have anything for Mr. Soto? Do you have anything else? No. Oh, okay. Thank, Thank you, for you your very time. much. Yeah. Okay, there's nothing else on the agenda, so move for adjournment. No, nope, may, oh. may I raise an issue? Oh, sure. Mr. Dietz, uh, you had something you uh, wanted to bring to our attention this uh, this evening? Yes, yeah, so I guess I'd like to, uh, of course, unfortunately, Alice is not here, but we had a, a few questions that, that we had asked uh, regarding children and youth and, and uh, uh, for human services. Uh, I would like to, unfortunately, she's not here for, for answering the questions that, that we had. Um, I was approached by, by several people, obviously, with the, uh, you know, the meeting we had the other month about human services and, and the Packer incident. Um, uh, good friends of, of my wife and I, they actually adopted a, a child that Mrs. Packer was the uh, representative for the county that was in their home multiple times. Now, I'll make clear that they, they have no inclination that any issue arise, but it did show that they're, you know, the, you know, how personal it is and, and how the, the touch that these people had in some of these communities and and, um, and I wanted to point out that you know the actions that one does not represent the the people that we have on the uh, uh, in children and youth and in, in human services overall so I did have a few questions um, we can share them I guess everybody got them I don't to go through them or, or anything but just you know some general questions that, that I had asked and, and they got back to me on um, nothing that was specific that would you know interfere w with the investigation but just part to, to show the the work that the um uh, our people in the department of, of children and youth do and now one of the things uh, you know i did want to ask her about it looking through it you look at our caseload size um you know between 12 and 25 and they recommend uh 12 to 15 so you know we are almost double on some of these and we do have a, a bunch of uh positions that are open um, you know, we had the earlier committees today talking about, you know, parks and open space and, and various things, and, and I think all that's important. Um, this is one of the, the real things that, that you know, the, the people in the county put on us to, to take care of. And just want to make sure, I guess, the administration that, that um, obviously, I know we're trying to fill these spots and stuff, but, you know, if we do anything we can, you know, the county-wide or, or council-wise to make sure these seat positions get filled up and, and you know, Yeah, uh, I'm, I don't have the, I didn't bring the copy of the response that you received, but I believe if you look into that particular question, uh, Mr. Dietz, you see that we have a, we have a normal turnover uh, within the department. I think that's really just a reflection of the type of industry, the social work uh, type of industry, so it's not extraordinary uh, with that. Uh, and then uh, in terms of recruiting and replacing, that's a, a, an always ongoing uh, type of effort that we make in order to fill the positions as rapidly as possible. There's no hold up. Um, Allison and her team are doing everything can to keep those positions filled uh, where we can. Yeah, so I was just worried about, obviously, 
by putting so much of a workload on them, we burn them out and cause them to leave sooner, you know, I mean, to, to well, make your time less. Again, I think part of, uh, part of the workload issue that you have, uh, again, is the state, um, I believe yeah. it was two years ago, changed uh, right. 22 different laws which, which swelled um, the uh, reportable cases yeah. and investigations that have to be done. Uh, in addition, they also, uh, I believe there were two computer systems that had to be adopted uh, based on those changes. So some of that, some of that caseload, those caseload numbers are a reflection really of that. And again, I think we're, we're still within the, uh, the acceptable uh, averages around the state, if I recall. The yeah, numbers. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a little under, there. I think, actually. Yeah, but, yeah. so, uh, and it is a, an active conversation that Alice and, and uh, uh, Kevin have as to, you know, are we, are we making sure things are moving uh, and keeping things uh, uh, servicing the, the pot, uh, the uh, taxpayers. Does right. um, anybody have anything else? All right, well, motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you.